and welcome to our 2016 Ganpad and Manju Patel Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm Cordelia Ontiveros. I'm the Interim Dean for the College of Engineering here at Cal Poly Pomona. I want to welcome you all. Thank you so much for coming out to our event. The Distinguished Lecture Series was started by the College of Engineering to broaden the educational experience of Cal Poly Pomona students, faculty, and staff. We are committed to a comprehensive approach to engineering education, and so for the past three years, we have invited thought leaders to provide the campus community opportunities to learn from a diversity of ideas and innovations. This evening will be no different. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Kevin Patrick Grundy, Chief Operating Officer at Sarcos Corporation. Kevin graduated from Cal Poly Pomona with a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical and Electronics Engineering in 1979 and a Master's degree in 1982. Kevin has gone on to achieve exceptional accomplishments throughout his career. And it all started with turning down a job offer from Steve Jobs. <laughs> Steve Jobs called Kevin, insisting that he join his next computer team. Kevin was part of the founding design team for the computer, and that was used to invent the World Wide Web. Since then, Kevin has gone on to be involved with numerous startups developing pioneering new technologies. These technologies have been acquired by companies like DirecTV, Intel, and Motorola for as much as $1 billion. He has obtained 43 patents, and he is now Chief Operating Officer of Sarcos Corporation, where he is involved in the development of exoskeleton robots akin to what you have seen in Iron Man. I'd like to go through a little bit of history before I invite Kevin up to speak. Uh, he and I were both students here at the same time at Cal Poly Pomona, and we were both involved with Tau Beta Pi Engineering Honor Society. I was president, and then the following year, Kevin was president. So this is a program that Kevin has kept as a souvenir over the years from the initiation banquet. Uh, when he was initiated, you can see my name there as president, and you can see Kevin's name circled there as one of the initiates at that banquet, Tau Beta Pi. So many years later, here we are back on campus at Cal Poly Pomona, ready to have our distinguished lecture. Before I invite Kevin up to the podium, I'd like to show a brief video that was created when he was named the distinguished alumni for the College of Engineering. I've been at TrueSight part-time for about 10 years. It fundamentally has a technology that improves the way images can be seen by humans by adjusting how the luminance in that image is distributed. Now that there's a lot of videos going on in the world, it pays to have images that are much easier on the eyes. I was born an electrical engineer. Uh, from the time I was very young, I was building gadgets and widgets and radios. And Why not go to the best place that was within 10 miles of my home? What you get at Cal Poly is a huge benefit of understanding what it takes to actually make something rather than guessing at it. I've been very successful in the Valley being among the short supply pragmatists because of Cal Poly. A couple of colleagues of mine that went to Cal Poly were already up in the Bay Area and they, they had just been hired by Steve Jobs to go make the next computer. This is back in 1986. And Next was looking for somebody with my talents, so my friends had recommended to Steve that they hire me. And I said, no, you know, I don't want to move. My family's here, all of those normal excuses. Steve called me just in the middle of some day. He's going, well, what? I'm not good enough for you? Or what do you want to do with your life? All these kinds of questions that come at you. I, you know, I'm in my mid to late 20s. I'm going, well, you know, uh, I don't know. So anyway, they convinced me to go work up there. It turns out that there were five of us on the design team that created the next computer. And the story behind why the next computer is so important is Tim Berners-Lee had developed the World Wide Web concept on a next computer. Three out of the five engineers that built that computer went to Cal Poly Pomona. So I think one element that really sets Cal Poly apart is this idea of partnering with industries and trying to bring the pragmatism of those companies into the campus. You can't teach this stuff in a vacuum. You have to bring in outsiders that are in the middle of it, and the fact that Cal Poly makes that part of their, their core mission statement, or at least it did when I was here, I think is just phenomenal.
As a brief programming note, after Kevin speaks, we'll have an opportunity for a question and answer and discussion session. We have uh, three by five cards that you can use to write down your question. We'll collect those questions and then ask them after the end of the talk. Also, after Kevin speaks and we have the question and answer, we'll invite Mr. Gampat Patel to come up and say a few words. The lecture is named after Gampat Amanju Patel, who are very generous donors to the College of Engineering, and the lecture series is named after them. He's also one of our electrical engineering alumni. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kevin Grundy. Wow, it's good to be back. I was telling Cordelia earlier, uh, between graduating as an undergrad and getting my master's, I actually was a lecturer at the college. And uh, I was teaching in the computer science department. Uh, I had a lot of fun. What I was doing was importing electrical engineering into the computer science lexicon. And uh, the class that I liked the most was taking people from sand up to uh, computers, which is, well, where does a transistor come from? How do you make a transistor into a gate? How do you make a gate into an ALU? How do you make an ALU into a CPU? How do you go on and on and on and on? And <clears throat> I thought I would define success today because this is a lecture. This is not a, a highly polished marketing uh, uh, presentation. I, I really do want to lecture and get into the, the nitty gritty, but let's define success in, in a very interesting way, which one of my last lectures when I was at Cal Poly was um, in the winter and I was up on the board and I was doing my thing and I was making great progress. I thought I was really connecting and then just all of a sudden I hear somebody throw up. And the first thing that came to mind was, was the lecture that bad? <laughs> and it just turned out the guy had the flu and we quickly had to go get out of the, the, the classroom. But I'll, I'll define success tonight as if everybody stays calm and keeps their uh, food down. <laughs> um, so I would like to start off uh, by telling you that um, I'm very excited to be here because one of the major modes of what I've done in my life is to mentor and teach. There's nothing finer for me than to, to impart or transfer what I've learned uh, to, to people that would listen. And the fact that you're all here listening is just awesome for me, because not everybody listens. So I want to thank you for being here. And with that, I'll try and get this thing to light up and get going. Um, so how do I turn this thing on? There we go. The right button? Oh, on the right. Okay. Oh. Why don't you do it? Okay. And then which ones? Uh, it just says. Okay. Um, so, there's about 45 slides. I'm going to try and pace myself. I told Cordelia earlier that. I'm so excited about what this stuff is, I could spend like five minutes per slide and I'm not gonna do that. So if you have questions, take notes and I'll try and do my best afterwards to go into more detail. Um, another little vignette is, what is the most important thing that I've found over the course of my career de dealing in technology? And so I put it on the first slide. And you're going, what? What are you talking about? And <clears throat> So as the video tells you, I was born an electrical engineer. From the time I was three, I was plugging stuff into wall sockets, smoke, solder, the whole thing. My, my mother was having heart attacks regularly about what I was doing. And up until I was about 15, I had thought, wow, all I'm going to do is solder stuff together. I'm going to build widgets, gadgets, whatever, until I wound up in an English class in high school with uh, Mrs. Elliot. And there was a transformation in my life that was so complete that I, to this day, still stay in touch with that teacher. She's 86 years old, lives up near San Luis Obispo, and we correspond regularly. And what happened was this, was she had got me into literature. She taught me that there's a whole other world other than wire soldering and whatnot. And uh, so I put this up here because not that I want you to go off and do what I did, which I regularly read the dictionary in the morning while munching on cereal. But what I found was the larger my vocabulary, 
the easier it was for me to, to explain things to other people. In other words, these are metaphors for larger ideas, larger concepts. Now, I, I could say I'm sad, or I could say I'm Saturnine, but there's a nuance and there's a difference. So with innovation, what I've found, if you want to brainstorm and quickly get to common ideas, the more language you have that you share that's more nuanced, you can transfer information rapidly, right? Because if we're all using sad, 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 but there are shades of gray of sad, then, you know, maybe we'll do better if, if we have a larger vocabulary. So um, to me, this is my transformation, and it was additive. It didn't subtract anything from my technical abilities, but the ability to actually stand here like I am now, have this conversation and not stumble, has a lot to do with my confidence with words. So I, I, I really think that's very important. Um, now we're getting into the propeller head stuff. Um, <clears throat> these are just but a few of the things that course in my head all the time. Why? I don't know. They do. I've memorized a whole bunch of things uh, because they've become handy to me. Uh, you'll see in a second here wh why these are at the tip of my tongue. I, I really don't want to reach in my pocket all the time and say, you know, I wonder what. What does this mean? Do I have to go get a calculator out, or can I just, on the fly, interpret something? This is important for innovation, because if you're hamstrung by an impediment that gets in the way of you creating something, how many of you had a fleeting moment of like, wow, that's interesting, that's, and, and one, you don't write it down, okay, because either you're driving or whatever, uh, or you get distracted. So what I found is, Maybe I can solve the problem on the fly, right then and there. I see something, I go, wow, can, can that really be done that way? Can I do a rule of thumb? Is there something out there that I'm already aware of and can I apply it while, while I'm doing my thing? Because look, your brain is this ginormous, sophisticated thing that, that has so much horsepower, it's mostly in idle. So I've learned over time, let's get it out of idle. Uh, don't get distracted. If you see something, let's go do something with it. So um, I have many more of these things in my head than I care to admit, but they do come in handy, and I'll show you an example in a second. Um, the next thing that dances around are these relationships. Now, honestly, not like the dictionary sitting down at breakfast learning all these words. I just have had a knack over the course of my education when I see some of these things, I go, huh. Ah, that really makes sense. I, you know, that relationship makes sense to me. I've seen it in life. I've seen it. And, and now, wow, if I run up against this again, it'll, it'll help me try to describe to either myself or somebody else why it's the way it is. Um, so being an electrical engineer, I have a far more large set of these things than, than, than the whole set here. But the point I want to make on this slide is, it's really important not just to know the formulas in your discipline, okay? You all take physics, you all take some mechanical engineering, F equal MA, you have E equal IR. The, the more that you can crib up and memorize in all these disciplines some of the relationships that are fundamental, that will help you invent because you won't have to get stalled if you have an epiphany and say, you know, I, I don't know anything about mechanical stress, I don't know anything about uh, corrosion, I don't know anything about uh, m metallurgy. Uh, so, so that's why this is important. <clears throat> now I'm going to get some guffaws here because there's a slide ruler in the middle of this and some of you may not even know what a slide ruler is. Um, and, and I'm going to pick these apart one at a time, but the reason I put the slide ruler in there is n not that I go home and do that, um, but I did inherit my father's slide ruler. He was an electrical engineer, and before calculators came out, I shudder to think that you'd ever do engineering without a calculator, but they had these things. But the fascinating thing about the slide ruler was, if you used it but for two or three hours, you began to see relationships in numbers. So these slide rulers had just the normal multiply scales on them, but they also had hyperbolic scales, they had uh, trigonomo trigonometric scales, and, and the amazing thing is, is just as if I go back, a slide ruler 
is an embodiment of a huge set of numbers that have relationships to each other. Okay, now I have not memorized, um, I, I've not memorized the scale there, but if you use a slide ruler for a couple of hours, you go, wow, y you know, the relationship on multiply, that's interesting on cosines and all of this, because when you use the calculator, you sort of get divorced. You, you, you let all of that stuff just take place. And I'm not arguing that you shouldn't use a calculator, of course. But what I'm arguing for is when you want to innovate, it's, it's about instant recall, relationships, constants, so that when you see a pattern, you can quickly st start connecting dots. Um, let's just go through a few of these. Uh, how many of you know what this is? Awesome, okay. I'm an electrical engineer, but this is sort of like the biggest plaything in, in, in stuff. You know, I want to build a box, screws, nuts, bolts. You just open it up and it's like a toy land of like, wow, if I wanted to do that, I'd just buy, buy it from here. This, the same thing, um, let's go over here. Why do you think I put vinegar up here? Do you know how many things you can do with vinegar if you put your mind to it? I, I know you gotta be smiling because that's chemical engineering. Um, just recently my wife went out and bought uh, on a, a yard sale or something, some of these old uh, uh, filing cabinets that could hold a lot of stuff. My wife likes a lot of stuff, so she bought it and it was all rusted out and they had rollers. And she, she tried everything in the planet to go unwedge the rollers. I said, go get the vinegar. And she put it in the vinegar and three days later the whole thing rolled and everything was fine. Uh, and there's plenty of other things you can do with vinegar. Um, tools. These I use Excel a lot, even to the exclusion of MATLAB. There's wonderful mapping and, and plotting tools in Excel. But, but Excel to me is just another relationship tool. If you can start establishing relationships and see them, it'll start connecting more dots. And uh, this is one that I like too, screen grabbing. If you're in the middle of something on a computer and you have a thought and you don't want to lose it, do a screen grab. Go, go send it off, send it to yourself or whatever so you don't lose the thought. And, and I think you're picking up the theme here is keep your brain occupied. Don't let it slow down. Don't let you lose the thought because thoughts are what create innovation. And then of course the analog to McMaster's is DigiKey. For those of you that are electron heads, uh, DigiKey is the Disneyland of parts buying. Um, it, you could spend three hours just looking around at all the things that you could do if you had enough money if you weren't a poor student to go play around just by ordering parts out of DigiKey. So this is important for me because every time I want to invent something, I, uh, I go to my old standards and the last thing I want to comment on, that's just a chuck for a turning lathe. How many of you actually run a lathe? Wow, this is awesome. Uh, I grew up in a garage. Um, my, my father restored theater pipe organs for a hobby, and it took us 40 years to redo one. But we had all the machinery in the garage, and I just, without any training, I just put stuff in and I started learning. So I touched it, I felt it, and I have a really good understanding of how things are made. So with that, let me move on. Um, condensing all of what I've just said here, and maybe there's even a little bit more, but the way I view innovation is this. You, you have to be curious every day, okay? There isn't a day where you park your curiosity. You, it's like, oh, I'm taking a vacation. I'm not curious anymore. No. I'll give you an example in a second here of, of how, how you can take everyday scenarios expand your curiosity and innovation. You always have to be in learn mode, okay? Um, if you don't understand something, take a little bit more time. See if you can figure out what you need to learn. The no fear is the hardest one. And this is what took me a while out of getting out of Cal Poly. So fear and engineering are sort of at odds. When you're trained as an engineer, you're trained to say, look, you can't have a failure. Uh, if you're going to be a professional engineer, you have to adhere to all these things to make sure the, the, the catwalk doesn't fall, the building doesn't crush, the earthquake doesn't. Uh, so there's a lot of fear in, in saying, you know, I don't want anything to fail. But the thing is, if you, will, if you want to innovate, you have to personally fail. You have to take the risk of trying something and failing. 
all right? And the more you do it, the easier it gets. I keep telling my kids, you're young enough to get all your failures out of the way early, all right? So I encourage them to take more risks and whatnot. And when you're in an engineering program, you have all these formulas that are safe for you. And I can share with you my adventure with Steve Jobs, who regularly would come into our offices and say, I want this, that, or that. And you would go look at your manuals or you'd know the equation and say, the guy's nuts. You can't do that. And if, if you let that seep into you and you would say to yourself, well, you know, the guy's off his rocker. I'm not going to do it. But maybe one time out of 20, because he forced you into ignoring the physics of it, there was that one sliver, maybe 5%, 1 in 20 chance that you found something that was overlooked because you were just hanging your hat on the formula. That's the point I want to make, which is you have to be able to go outside yourself, get outside the comfort of the formula, and maybe take the risk of inventing something new or, or, or saying to yourself that, wow, uh, maybe there is a different way and at, at, the, at the cost of you spending too much time and actually failing. Um, I alluded to this a little earlier. Solve problems every day. This is a skill set, man. Um, every day I'm in the car, I have this vision system called my eyeballs, and I'm looking around. Um, so one of my hobbies is, because my dad was an electrical engineer, and he, he, as I was growing up, he would talk about all these uh, high voltage line feeds and, and whatnot. So I'll be driving down the road, and I'll look at the feeds going down the road, and I'll try and figure out whether it's 12 kV or 6 kV. I try and figure out how, how the distribution works. And then uh, after doing that for a few years, uh, I think I'm qualified to work for the electric company just because it's, I, I'm going, why do they do that? Why, why are the wires like that? Now, does that serve me any general purpose? Not really. It keeps my brain occupied. It's not like I'm listening to an MP3 with the latest music. I just tend to occupy my brain with, well, hey, I got this great visual system, great CPU, what am I going to do with it? Um, learn to estimate, size things up. Part of innovation is to be able to quickly size things up, synthesize, put it together, and see if you can come up with something new. Um, and finally, build stuff. I love building stuff. Paper mache, uh, go to McMaster's, go to DigiKey. I, I don't care, silly stuff. Um, when I was a kid, I built a lie detector machine. Uh, I think I was nine or 10. And I really didn't have the skills to build a lie detector, so I built a shocker. And what I did was <laughs> I, I, uh, I basically built this box. I said to my family and friends, I built a lie detector. And I'd have them put their hand on it. And I'd ask them a question that I knew they would lie. And I'd push the shock button. Uh, uh, but that, that was fun. And, and you learn to build better things over time. Okay, uh, so this is what I'm talking about. If you're at the amusement park and you're how many here can tell me that is going? Do, do you guys have the skills to tell me how fast it's going? Yes, but the engineers in here, do, do you have head? It's not like a, no, that's too fast. Let me walk you through what I did. Now, I may be totally wrong, but I like just walking up, and as my vision system comes and looks at things, I go, well, how fast is that really going? Okay? So, we can argue, but my little brain says that's three feet. And what am I keying off of? It's just the people down, that's a and a half feet, okay. Three of those gets to Can we do that? Okay. Um, again, 32. Remember this one? Uh, angular acceleration over. All. Okay, this stuff I know, but it's sort of fun if you're in the music park and you, you, you tell some kid, you know, how fast is that going? I'll tell you, and then within a few seconds you can tell them. So, how many can take the square root of 320 without a calculator? <laughs> All right, so let's do some quick math. 
Okay, if you're in the digital section of Cal Poly Engineering, you know that 16 squared was what? Yes, yes. So there's, there's two ways to do it. One is if you're a digital head, 16 squares 256, 20 squares 400, so you know it's between 16 and 20. But there's a really cool way to do squares um, that I won't tell you about that <laughs> if you just go Google doing two-digit squares, you can do it probably within four seconds on any number between zero and 100. Uh, and I like those things because you can actually extrapolate that to, to three-digit numbers just ignore the last one and then add four zeros after it. So I, th I think the point is, is when, when, when you have this at the tip of your hand, you, you can actually, so I just remember 60 miles, 80 feet per second. Add 18 feet per second with the square root of 320, right? So how many miles per hour is that? How many times does 18 go into 88? About five, ninety. Five times uh, five times eighteen is, is ninety. Okay, so twenty percent, one out of five, of sixty is how many miles per hour? Twelve, twelve or thirteen. All right. So I don't I don't want to I don't want to make this a quick math lesson, but I wanted you to see that whatever you're looking at, instead of wasting all of those CPU cycles in your head, exercise your brain, keep it active. All right, now, um, let's get on to how I view innovation on my day-to-day -day scale of how I invent things. It's highly collaborative, because I, I tend to hang out with people that are really good at what they do uh, I make a point in my career to sidle up to those people because I'm, I'm just, I'm so hungry to learn, all right? I have my own vertical expertise, but it's never enough, okay? So I, I seek out places and cheap things and challenges so that I can just stand next to somebody that has the goods that I do not have. So I'm, I'm creating a model here of what I think, and you can argue with this, this is, um, this is not provable, this is Kevin's formula for how he thinks innovation works. So if you're in, say, chemistry, and chemistry is a long-standing discipline, they've invented a lot of things. And I, I represent it as a, a curve, a bell curve, if you will. And I say, the higher up it goes, the more fundamental knowledge you learn about chemistry. So, so maybe somebody figures out a, 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 a new way for molecules to be put together a single at a time, single molecule at a time, and that's an advancement. So, so this thing um, can do this, which is it starts out there, and then all of a sudden a breakthrough happens and the whole bell curve goes up. But let's just go look at the, the, the tails where the applications are. Um, see? where you actually apply it, it doesn't move up very much. Why? Because it takes a long time for a, a fundamental innovation to work out to the tails of application. And that's the way I view it. So all of the research universities that like pushing up that bell curve, that's great stuff. That's not what I do. And you'll see in a second where I play. Because I don't want to wait. I really don't want to wait for that innovation to pull up the tail or to pull up the wings. Okay, this is why hanging out with people not in your major helps out tremendously, because you have different people that have different skills and they have different curves. I'm not talking physically, I'm talking metaphorically. <laughs> All right, so if you have a guy that's doing thermo, and I hated thermo, so I would probably like Sue a lot better than Peter. But you have people at the university and actually out in business, if you're in a larger company, you have all these disciplines. The worst thing in my mind you can do is hang out in the thermo, um, the thermo lab for your whole career, all right? The real adventure comes from knowing Fred, Sally, Peter, and Sue all at once. And it doesn't matter how high their curve is because you'll see in a second here um, why it doesn't matter. So my model of innovation is don't push the curve up. That's, boy, uh, 
no offense to Cordelia and her PhD, but I'm not a PhD and I, I can't climb that high. But what I can do is I can fill in between. And that's fun. If I know somebody that knows electromagnetics and chemistry and materials, look at that free space in between, all right? You can be just as innovative down at the tail as you can up at the top. And in fact, most of the innovation comes down, down at the back because it, you're, you're not trying to lift the whole mountain, you're trying to fill in. So an example would be like that. Can I invent something new that's an amalgamation between different disciplines? Uh, and, and for the last maybe 15 years in my career, this is what I've done a lot of. And I have a couple of examples to walk you through. Hopefully, you'll find them scintillating. Um, all right, here we go with the propeller head stuff again. I ignore the detail in terms of uh, th those actual equations. I hate them too. But when I look at those equations, I remember the relationships, which is inductance is really a function of the cross section of the conductor. So what you're seeing here is a printed circuit board trace. They're in every product, your iPhone, your Samsung, your TV, er everywhere. And it basically consists of a piece of copper that's usually a rectangular cross section over a ground plane. And it has what they call distributed inductance and, and distributed capacitance. And the, the general formulas can vary, but you see the inductance gets lower as the cross section gets bigger. That's, how, that's what I really care about here. I know that relationship. Do I want to remember that it was log 2L over rho and, and then this constant plus? I don't really care. But what I carry around with me, this, this general rule of thumb, as conductors get bigger, their inductance gets lower. OK, good rule of thumb. What am I going to do with that? All right? Same thing with capacitance. So capacitance is area over distance. So the area of this conductor separated by that distance over the ground plane gives me capacitance. So it says the higher the area, the more the capacitance, the more the distance, the lower the capacitance. OK, we're done with the propeller head stuff. What this means is this conductor, if I put a signal on this end and it squirts out the other end, actually goes through an inductor and a capacitor. And if I chop it into little pieces, like if I vivisection this, chop, 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 I can just have increasingly smaller elements and you wind up with something like this. Okay. You wind up with a bucket brigade. So every single wire on the planet can be modeled like that. It's an inductor and a capacitor. Um, and I hated doing all of this an analysis because you, you go into like uh, the second year electronic courses here, at least when I did, it was like, oh, phasers and, and, and I'm just, okay, I'm, I don't want to do that. I, I just want to play. So the model is I have all of this distributed inductance and capacitance. Now, an inductor resists an electron appearing at its front door. So if I put a bunch of voltage in front of an inductor, the first thing the inductor does, if I, if I were to attribute um, a personality to an inductor, it says, no, no way. You're not getting through me. You just showed up. We have to have a more formal relationship, OK? So that's what an inductor does. Whereas a capacitor, well, you put an electron near a capacitor, and it gets swallowed up faster than you can blink your eyes. So they're a yeah, different kind of relationship. But when you put the two together, they work in concert, and they actually bucket brigade, and I'll show you that. If I put a pulse on at the front, and, I, and it's represented by a bunch of electrons, this is what happens. So you see, it took a little time, because the inductor says, no way. And then it just starts moving down. And I wish they had this graphic when I was in second level. I'm going, oh, yeah, that's what's happening. Um, there were way too many equations for me. But eventually, that bucket brigade winds up at the end. And it all appears. And if there's no resistance or no loss, boy, that pulse that I put in at the beginning comes out at the end. And this is true for every wire on the planet. It's just that if it's a wire, these values are so slow or so low or so minuscule 
that you can barely detect the delay, but it does happen. It's almost at the speed of light. This is cool stuff, right? I put a good signal in, a PCB trace, and it comes out the other end. And life isn't that simple. Every one of your cell phones has a circuit board in it. It has multiple traces. But dag nabbit, everybody is in a traffic jam. It's like the LA Basin. Roads going everywhere. I got to get this electron here, that electron there. And they introduced something called a VIA, which is this big tower of metal to go from the top into the middle or down to the bottom. And all of a sudden, I've disrupted my little dance. The inductance and the capacitance are different. What does that mean? OK, so I've taken a slice here. And remember, we had those stupid little equations that I don't want to really remember. But I remember this is as the cross section gets bigger, the inductance goes lower. And this thing is bigger than the trace in terms of its mass. And as the distance uh, gets longer, from a, a ground plane, and you'll trust me on this because I'm not going to go into detail. So now I have less inductance, more capacitance. And instead of having a nice, well-formed bucket brigade where all the inductors are the same and all the capacitors, I've now introduced something different. What happens? OK, so let's go back to my pulse again. Um, let's do the same thing. The electrons appear. The inductor says, no way, Jose. Here we go. Same thing starts. But that's a smaller inductor. So a couple of the electrons escape real quick because of the inductor. And then the pattern changes as it goes. Because now I've changed something. And so instead of winding up with the same pattern at the end, I wind up with something different. And now I have a smushy pulse. For, for those in electrical engineering, you, you know what this is. This is dispersion. This is loss. This is all sorts of nasty stuff. And, and if the disruptions are big enough, OK, if, this, if there are too many of these disruptions, and if I go back um, here, look at how many disruptions are possible. Uh, it's, a, it's accretive. It, 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 it accrues. And so eventually, I might wind up with a pulse that's non-existent. Okay. Oh, I'm glad we're through that, because I didn't want to uh, do a whole lecture on electrical engineering. But I want to get to the point, which is, in today's world, this is a typical product that's even in your pocket today. You have a semiconductor that's on a substrate that actually has the same kind of traces and holes in it. But they're, they're small. And it gets soldered down onto your circuit board through solder balls. And then you have the big board, where you have two two chips, and that yellow trace is actually the path from one chip to the next. But you see how tortuous it is. It's not this just clean bucket br brigade between here and there. It has to get inter intervened by this, this via, that solder ball, and all of that. And this is what has forced the whole industry to slow down. So right now, when you're on a circuit board and you're trying to clock something up around two or three gigabit, you know, at that rate, these impediments are really tough to handle and it takes a lot of power to go correct that. It's impossible to do 20 gigabits with these kinds of structures. Otherwise, this, the, the pulse that goes in looks nothing like a pulse coming out because it gets destroyed. Okay. So, how do you solve it? I want you to look at this and see if you see the invention and understand what we came up with. And I could spend an hour telling you about all of the structures we created to get rid of those problems. So how many of you see what's going on here before I truly explain it? Good. Maybe I fooled everybody. All right. Um, so let's go back. What's causing most of the problem is having to drill into the board. It disrupts my inductor and capacitance pair. It changes them, right? So anytime I drill into a board in order to get from one layer to the next, it introduces problems. 
let's not drill holes. Let's create a well or a cavity in a board. And then on the IC carrier, the chip carrier, this thing here, don't drill. So make the, the chip package a mirror image of the excavation in the board. That way when I launch a signal out of this package, it can launch from a ground plane directly into that plane and I've gotten rid of a drill hole. And you go, oh, wait, that's so simple. Why, why did you think of that? So that's why I say, don't drill, excavate. So in a typical printed circuit board, this is all just flat. And then you put, you put chips on top, and then you drill holes to get to the middle layers to get through the traffic jams. Well, I'm saying, no, no, no. Don't drill, excavate. Let's just create a whole big well that's the size of the chip package. And when I put the chip package in, it has the, the inverse stair-stepping, I call the stair-step technology. And then, then when the signal launches, it doesn't have to go through these crazy inductive and capacitive changes. What does this result in? Instead of being limited to two or three gigabits per second in terms of communicating from chip to chip, I've measured this at 20 gigabit at one-fifth the power of normal chip I.O. buffers. And I have, with my friends, because of brainstorming, you know, this just didn't leap off our heads. We just sat around going, well, how do we get rid of this? How do we get rid of this? And, and you look at this and go, well, that's so simple. Don't drill, excavate. So we have all these patents that go into how do you make stair-step packages, stair-step circuit boards, stair-step connectors, all with getting rid of the disruption of the, the bucket brigade. And, and this took the work, um, and I'll get to it in a second, of a collaborative brainstorming set of people who had skills that I didn't have and vice versa. So, so here's a chip package where it's hard to see up here, but this is actually a stair step. That's a, that's a layer for the chip package. That's another layer. And so you, there's no drills. There's, there's no disruption of the bucket brigade. And this stuff screams. Is it in manufacturing yet? No. Samsung bought the patents about three years ago, and we figure within the next two years, you're going to see a lot more packaging like this that allows you to go 20 gigabits. You don't need optical. You can stay electrical. Ju just by changing how you manufacture stuff. Now, I couldn't have done this on my own. How did I do it? How did we do it? Let's go back to my curve or my mountain metaphor here. Be being the electrical engineer, I got tasked with, well, how do, how do signals behave inductance and capacitance? So I was nominated and I, I was on the tip of my tongue. I knew those formulas. I knew what could happen. Gary was a mechanical engineer, knew about structures on connectors, the metallurgy of, of uh, solder of, of, of metal. And then Joe, the materials guy, he's been in the PCB industry for 40 years. He knows everything about what materials work, what don't. And then the magic is you come up with stair-step PCB. And it solves a huge problem for the industry. And admittedly, it's a little bit soon, but it's sort of crazy thinking. Excavate, don't drill. Uh, so that's my first example, and <clears throat> I thought before I get get away with it, I wasn't going to make this particularly interactive. But if you had any quick questions about this, uh, or or did I confuse anybody? Maybe I lost you all. Um, okay. Um, this is my favorite, mostly because. A fair number of you probably don't understand what this is, which is called free-to-air broadcast. Um, Netflix comes in through the, the, the network. Uh, we, we all have Hulu. Uh, we have streaming. Um, and it costs money because you have to have a broadband link and whatnot. But all around us, from Mount Wilson, they're broadcasting gorgeous 12 megabit MPEG-2 video that I defy anybody to find better quality than that. It's all around us. But you can't get to it because no one talks about it unless you go to the top of your roof and you put an aerial up and you run a coax down, plug it into your TV, and then it only goes to your TV. And Well, that's no good because I can't watch it in my bedroom. I can't watch it on my mobile phone. But I assure you, if you really want to have a little bit of fun, go, go to the local e electronics store, and if you have a TV with an antenna input, buy the cheapest antenna you can, 
go plug it into the little uh, barrel in the back and just go tune into the signal and see what gorgeous quality is. And um, about four or five years ago, I said, well, you know, everybody's paying 100 bucks a month for cable TV, for broadband and whatnot. This stuff, at least ABC, CBS, Fox, and NBC are all around me in the highest possible quality. Why can't I get to it? And the problem is this. Just short of putting an antenna up on the roof, which nobody wants to do because it's not very convenient, all you can do is go to the store and buy a cheesy little antenna and hope that it works. And it doesn't usually work. I may get one station, two possibly, but not all four. And that's useless, right? Because if I want to tune into my favorite show, if, if, if all of them are on ABC or Fox, um, and I can't get Fox or whatever, then I'm, I'm hosed. Um, so back in the early days, they used to have TVs with, with rabbit ears. Uh, um, OK, so what a rabbit ear is an antenna that sat on top of your TV. And there's no mistake as to its size. The size of that antenna is actually matching the wavelength of what's being broadcast. So if I can, if I can create a product or a solution where if you went to a website, for example, and you put your address in, OK? And I could guarantee that if you bought an antenna, it would work for all stations reliably. That's a product that would be interesting, right? Because once you bought that product, you wouldn't have to pay anybody other than just the price of getting the equipment. It's a really tough problem because I don't know what your house is like, OK? And I don't know how far you are. Hold on to that thought. OK, so this is one of those cheesy antennas that you can buy that's about 10, 12 inches square, flexible. They say, buy it. It works great. Put it in your house, connect it to your TV. It's wonderful. And then you find out that when you do it, you get a couple of stations, but you don't get your station. We can fix that. But you have to understand some things. In the US, they broadcast in two different frequencies. One is VHF, which is this big and UHF, which is one-third the size. Why is this important? You'll see in a second. Not only is the wavelength important, but the amount of energy you get off of a, a signal when it gets to your house. So there's two elements. It's how, what's the periodicity of that wavelength, and then how big is the signal strength. Ah. My epiphany on antennas came from a model that I I generated to try and explain this to somebody that doesn't understand antennas, least of all me, because I'm not really an E&M guy. I work with an E&M guy. Um, and the best way to describe what an antenna is, it's a window, all right? If you have a house window and it's very narrow, like 10 inches, let's imagine you're in a house with a window that's 10 inches wide. And you're setting apart from the window and you're looking outside and of course, your field of view is very narrow. You could still see outside, but you're not seeing much. Well, depending upon what your antenna window size is, it can see certain things, or it can see partials. So if I have, say, metaphorically, a 10-inch window, and I have a UHF signal that happens to be 20 inches, really, in terms of propagation, what does that mean in terms of what an, what a, an antenna is? Well, let's just move the window on top of the signal. And you can see that I can see both the top and the bottom. This is a very good thing, because if I'm impressing a wavelength on top of something I'm looking at, I can see the whole, whole thing. That's a very efficient window for that signal, because I can sort of see the peak and the periodicity. Now, if I go to VHF, which is bigger wavelength, and there's reasons why they broadcast in VHF. I won't go into details, but they do both in the US, UHF and VHF. How does that window fare? OK. Uh-oh. You're right. You're stealing my show. But, but you're entitled. So if I have a 60-inch window and it's only 10 inches wide, I will see the signal, but in essence, I'm only seeing 
a lower version of it because I'm only capturing a part. Now, the epiphany for me is you could do all of Maxwell's equations until you're blue in the face and it doesn't make sense to me. This makes sense to me and I can explain it to people. Like, yeah, you're right. This is, this is how you get innovation because now the guys that aren't e &M guys, I can explain it to them that are in my circle of in innovators and they go, yeah, yeah, okay, I got it. Yeah, I, I think I can help you there. So, what you need is a bigger window. You get the prize, you, you got the next slide. Um, so, what this tells me is that cheesy little 10 inch um, antenna that they sell you at the electronics store, they say, go get all your stations. That 10 inch window won't do much for VHF. And that's why when you buy these cheesy little antennas, you're very disappointed because they didn't engineer it. They're trying to get a sale. You got suckered. Okay, but I want to design a system so that when you put your address into the website, I can send you an antenna that would work, and I can also sort of calculate what your signal strength would be. So, but you have to understand a little bit more about wave propagation. So, I broadcast, and the perfect world is it hits my antenna and I'm happy, it gets through the walls. But no, there's the San Gabriel Mountains in the way, there's big refrigerator trucks driving by, and ultimately what winds up at that antenna is a menagerie, call it a miasma. Uh-oh, there's that English stuff coming out again, all right? And what happens is I can have, wow, a benefit. If two waves that are the same just happen to be phase delayed because one's bouncing off something else, you all see this in, in your um, uh, math courses, you add up sine waves, they get twice as big. This is great. Man, if I put my antenna in the right spot, great signal. Uh-oh, what if it's in the wrong spot? And the adventure happens when I have ABC coming in and it bounces around a certain way and NBC comes in and bounces around a certain way and you get the picture where they don't all bounce the same way. So that cheesy little antenna at 10 inches is good for UHF, not for VHF. But you begin to understand why it doesn't work and why no one has really decided they're going to make a product like this because they can't guarantee anything. They don't understand the problem. They didn't take the time or they didn't care. All right, so excuse my graphics. I'm not the, the world's, this is a lecture. This isn't a marketing uh, uh, deck. So if it looks a little cheesy, it is, because it's a lecture. But I've annotated what happens if I find out where the peak is and the null is with a broadcaster in a house. And I didn't really, believe the extent to which this happened, so what did I do? I built a tool. This is the most fun part of this project was, I, I knew instinctively that this happens because I was taught all this stuff, interference, whatever, can I, can I fix it or do I even understand it? I don't understand it yet, let's go build a tool. So I built the tool. Um, and it's driven mostly by Excel. I didn't need MATLAB, and I had to do some other things. I had to build a receiver and do some things, but this is fascinating to me, because I told you earlier that the VHF wave is 60 inches about my wingspan here. But I'll be darned if you look at, if I map over a four foot by eight foot place in my house, a, v, a VHF energy in, in channel seven, which is 100 and, um, 75 megahertz, okay? What do you see? You see it undulate, there's another word, at about the frequency of the wavelength. And you would expect that, right? Because the wavelength is if they start adding up, they're gonna be about that size. So if you actually go in the middle of my house and you plot in a four by eight foot section of what you see of channel seven, you see that the signal strength rolls around like a hill at the, at the wavelength of channel seven. 
this is like x-ray vision. It's like, man, I have glasses. I can actually see TV signals. Now, what does this buy me that buys me understanding of what problem it is I'm trying to solve? But let's go to UHF. UHF was a third. Look at what it's doing. So this tells me that if I'm trying to receive a UHF TV signal, all I have to do is move my antenna about 10 inches, and I'll get to a peak or a valley. OK, you believe me because of what, what I'm seeing there? But if on channel 7, which is VHF, and I have a small antenna, I have to move it almost two and a half feet if I'm in a valley. OK, maybe I can do something a little differently and not have that problem. This is all enabled by building a tool, being curious enough to say, that is not a good enough model. I have to go spend time. I may fail. It took me probably three weeks to go build the tool to go see that. But now I see x-ray vision. In fact, I'll, I, I, be, I got so good at placing antennas, uh, I would go off and go to somebody's house. And without even doing any analysis, I would magically move the, I knew what stations were at fault or whatever, and I would just move the antenna, and everything would work right. And I became this magician, OK? I'm going, I'm not a magician. Well, I wouldn't tell him that. I just, if you want to think I'm a magician, fine, go ahead. But what it was, I did the work. So I, I got to understand all of this stuff. So there's one more ingredient left. If I want to build a product, you put your address in, and I know it's going to work for all the stations. I have to solve another problem, which was that undulation, OK? Antennas are directional if they want gain. Uh, I won't explain all the detail, but if you have an antenna facing one direction and the wave's coming at it, you get the full signal. But if it's turned sideways like this is, um, this is looking the wrong way. So most antennas have gain. They're windows. They look a certain way. <clears throat> so if this is my house in the room, and I have my original signal coming in the house and it's bouncing around, and I have a reflected signal blue and a reflected signal red. And this happens because we saw it in the undulation. They add and they subtract. I have my antenna, and I'm getting my signal right here. It's, it's piercing through the antenna. I'm watching ABC. I'm having a great old time. I'm watching the World Series, 12 megabit MPEG-2. It's gorgeous. I've never seen anything like it. And then something changes outside the house. OK. This blue signal, I think it's blue. It's a reflected signal. It's strong, but something moves. Oh, that big hit in the seventh inning, I missed it. Why? Look at this. Everything moved. And so I'm not, I'm not receiving anymore. OK, this happens all the time. And that's why you have those rabbit ears, and grandma gets up, and you know, grandpa's saying, well, can you move the rabbit ears over? Because the signal is shifted, and you got to move the rabbit ears. So how do you solve the problem? What you do is you say, with just another antenna at 90 degrees, I can pick up, most of the time, other reflections. So, so just not having one antenna, but having two, and putting them at 90 degrees, you can see what happens now. That second antenna picks up the red. The red is cruising by, but now with the second antenna. All right, so what does this all mean? If I have a house, and I'm in the middle of the house, and my stations are 33 miles away, the, the signals have to get through the walls. They start bouncing around. And I may have my TV somewhere around here. Can I build an antenna that gets all the signals all the time, regardless of shifting? signals? And the answer, of course, is yes, because I've done it. And here's what you get. By using two antennas instead of one on that, on that matrix, OK, right here, that's a 4 by 8 matrix. And I've tested this exact scenario, 33 miles, which is not indoor reception, by the way. Most people tell you that one of those cheesy little antennas are good for 15 miles out from the transmitter. This is 33 miles out. And with one antenna, 
this is the signal to noise ratio you get. And signal to noise ratio just tells you how much signal you have to go decode and watch baseball. If you go below 20 dB signal to noise ratio, you're in trouble. So with one antenna in the VHF band, and you can see, you can see the, the six foot undulation again. But because this only has one antenna, it, as signal shift, I can, I can completely drop out 10 or 20 dB. But with two antennas, no. So, what have I learned? Let's just go on to the UHF. The UHF looks a little different. Uh, it undulates a little bit uh, differently, but it, it's more peaky in terms of how we're... This is all enabled by me seeing this and understanding the problem. I'm not guessing. I'm not just sort of cutting out of cardboard. All oh, this antenna might work right. Um, so how do you build an antenna to take advantage of the fact that you have x-ray vision? Well, here's how you do it. First off, number one, recognize there's a difference between the 10-inch window and the 30-inch window. You can't have both and do the same job. So you have to admit, look, if I'm going to receive UHF and VHF, I better have two different antennas. That's number one. Number two, I better put them orthogonal to each other because in that scenario where the, the signals are moving around, I want to make sure that I don't interrupt my World Series play. So now I have four antennas in one. I have on top, this is a 10-inch structure, which is half the wavelength of UHF, is which, which is what you'd expect from a physics point of view. And there's two of them, one in this direction, one in that direction. And then you have two of these in the VHF. And it turns out, if you look at the total length of these loops of the VHF, they're 60 inches. So there's harmony in the universe. And you go, wow, OK, does that really work? Well, it does. If you look at the game plot, in other words, how well this thing works across all bands in the television reception um, world, it's flat response. I don't care whether you're channel 7 or you're channel 50. It has the same efficiency across all the bands. This is the fun part. How do you turn that into a product? Well, you get the industrial designers involved, and then you turn uh, a, a diagram like this. So here are the four, well, here are the two VHF antennas, and here's the two UHF, and this thing just smokes. You, uh, with some software that can predict from the actual broadcast tower out to your house. You couple it up with this antenna. I've, I've calculated you can get 95% effectivity by uh, doing all the special things you need to do, enabled by an antenna that's designed fit for purpose. But it's only because I took the time, I understood the problem, and I was able to use experts, Roger, mechanical me engineering on, on that structure, myself, tools, amplifiers, because I'm, I'm the electron head, and then Tom, uh, who's an antenna expert. And, and you wind up with a solution that nobody else has. And I didn't push the state of art of antennas. Those are standard antennas, loops and, and, and whatnot, um, amplifiers. So that's the second thing. Um, I would like to say that the most amount of fun I've ever had in my career doing stuff is always in this model, which is find really great people that don't do what you do, find a big problem, don't be afraid, start making tools, start experimenting, do it on your own time, or find a company that likes to do it. Google does a lot of that as well. But it's not about pushing the tip up, it's about filling in, in between. So those are my two examples. And I want to bring it home, tying it all together and how you make money. Because after all, um, how do we make money doing all of this? This is all fun and good, but um, most of us want to make money. So we're talking about innovation. Where does innovation come from? It just doesn't appear out of the blue like I just put it up here. It comes from people. And, and people are the driving force of innovation, and I put it on top, and you'll see in a second why. Um, so the relationship is, the more people you have involved, 
the more they understand their roles, the more that they are individually very good at what they do, and you can brainstorm and use all those tools, you're going to get a lot of innovation. But that won't get you to the market, all right? You have to have some element of quality, a, a perception of, I'm building something from a qualitative point of view that solves a problem. And so I've added the quality element here. And having worked for Steve for seven years, it, 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 it became very clear to me where his focus was. He hired the best people possible. And what that translates to is he hired all of these vertical, really good experts, and he put them in one building, which is what I'm telling you, is to go get really good people, mix them up. I'll, I'll tell you what he did. When he bought buildings to put us in, he ripped out the elevators. Okay, I was just, this is madness. The building had elevators. And he said, no, because I want people to mix. So he ripped out the elevators and he put these flowing staircases between the floors, wide, you know, huge, wide, 12 feet. And it worked. There was a lot of mixing. People just couldn't cloister themselves into the elevator. You had to go up and down the stairs. You bumped into people. Um, that's, a, that's a big ingredient of what's going on. So he hired the best people, really good at what they're doing, very innovative. Steve's view of quality any of you guys with a, a, an Apple product, you notice how beautiful it is? We all love the beauty, the lines, the, the, the sexiness of the phones and the, the pads and whatnot. That's Steve's vision of quality, and it's a great vision of what quality should be because it sells. People line up for hours, days ahead of new announcements. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's true, um, but he paves the way and he actually kicks you in the butt a lot to go beyond yourself. But I'll get to your point too because there's some engineering in here as well. Uh, if, okay. You need engineers because this as a vertical topples over. How many companies do you know do this? They are really great people, innovation, and then they get a really great quality thing, they're all excited, they're start up, boom, 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 go, and it starts getting bigger and bigger, and then it goes, boom. You know, only one out of 10 startups actually gets to any kind of meaningful um, financial place, and that's because this is insufficient. So, the first five years at Next, I actually cranked on and delivered the design of the computer. And silly me, at year five, the director of manufacturing went back to Florida for family reasons, and I raised my hand and I said, I'll go do manufacturing. So I volunteered to, to fill in the spot, and most of my colleagues said, are you nuts? Design is where it's at, Kevin. Don't, don't go backwards in your career. Why are you going into manufacturing? And it was a curiosity on my part to say, you know what? I've done enough design. I don't know how the back half, well I do, because all my designs had problems, I wound up in manufacturing anyway. So um, anyway, I decided to formalize my relationship with manufacturing. And for the last two years at Next, I actually ran manufacturing. And, and one of our investors, Canon, flew over and taught us how to manufacture. So I got like the world's best manufacturing team to come in and teach me how to manufacture. But I'm not going to digress any further. So you wind up. You need a base, you need cost, you have to manage cost. Engineers are good at doing that. But that can also be innovative. I don't want to mislead anybody. Innovation touches everything, whatever you do. I don't care if you're an engineer or you're an artist. Everything can be innovated, including cost. And then, of course, you have delivery. You have to put this all together, and I put a square up there because there's another kind of quality and it's called conformance to spec. Can I make the same beautiful thing the same exact way on the millionth unit as the first unit? So there's two elements of quality. They're both affected by innovation. Um, and then finally, you get to delivery. Cost, quality, and delivery are the base for a company to enable the people, innovation, and quality to stand. This is a hard thing to do because there's a lot of sexiness in, in outright going people innovation. It's, it's making this transition, but these are all innovative activities, right? I could land anywhere in a company. I 
trust me on this, I love the idea of innovating in any of these areas. I gave you a couple of examples from a design point of view. There's huge amounts of innovation in cost, conformance to spec, and delivery. And if you think about it, the first hire, the first really big hire Steve made when he got back to Apple in 96 was Tim Cook. He's the current CEO. You know what he did prior to Apple? Anybody know? He was the supply chain manager at what company, you remember? It was a computer company? No, it wasn't IBM. It was, um, no, uh, now I'm drawing a blank. It wasn't Dell, the competitor to Dell. Compaq, yeah, right. So, I'm gonna finish with this. You put this all together, people, innovation, qual cost, quality, and delivery. Apple has $240 billion in the bank, okay? And it's all centered on innovate, innovation. And uh, so I'm really excited about anybody in the room that's working on engineering because there's so much to be done, not, not only just in creating things, but on all these other um, all these other activities. So I think I did okay on time. Um, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, we do have just a few minutes for questions. If anybody has a question, you can raise your hand and somebody will come around the room with a, a, a card for you to write your question on. Um, in the meantime, I have just you know one or two questions that came in ahead of time. The first question is, have you visited any other countries for your work and how is it different from working on projects here in the U.S.? Yes, I've been, um, I've been to Britain. I did a development in the middle of sheep country in the middle of Britain and it was a surreal experience. Um, nowhere near the capability in my estimation of U.S. engineers. I think U.S. Engineers just tend to be more innovative. They, they tend to compartmentalize more in Europe than they do here. What I'm talking about where I'm, I'm playing in this field and that field and that field, they don't do that in Europe. It's like if, if, you're, if you're the connector guy, you're the connector guy and you do that for your whole career. I, th I, see, I see much more variation here uh, in the US. And I've also gone to Shanghai and set up manufacturing plants. Very similar in, in China as well, very vertical. Uh, so count yourself lucky. I think we do a really good job of cross-pollinating. Cal Poly, um, it's, it's true. What future opportunities do you see for innovators for non-electrical engineers? Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I'm fascinated by electromechanical, given where I'm at now. Um, as an aside, I just joined a company two months ago that's building exoskeletal robots. And it's a confluence between state-of-the-art electronics and mechanical and um, algorithmic because you want to do machine learning, artificial intelligence. So there's a lot of software that's just not electrical engineering. Um, and I will say, even though I graduated as an electrical engineer, uh, I'm, I'm very well versed in materials now and mechanical and, and actually a lot of software because I've just hung around a lot of people that are doing that stuff and I would encourage everybody to do that as well. Thank you very much for a very engaging lecture. We have a small uh, token of our appreciation, a little memento here for you from Cal Poly Pomona. Oh, wow, thank you. At this point, I'd like to invite Mr. Ganpat Patel to come up to say a few words. Good evening. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I can connect with you. <clears throat> we had a, most of the professors were, I, I had some little bit of time with Kevin, 
when he first came in and uh, uh, so we were exchanging the ideas and uh, we have a lot, most of the professors were common. And I was not born engineer. I'm an engineer by accident. But sometimes good accidents happens in the life. That's like running into a gorgeous woman. And Cal Poly also was an accident for me. Electrical engineering was also an accident for me. I actually came for to become a chemical engineer. So the, the main difference between myself and Kevin is he's the smart one and I'm the lucky one. <laughs> but we both must have worked pretty hard to get here. And uh, student, whether it's, some of you will be lucky and some of you will be smart, but keep working hard. There is no substitution for working hard. Um, I can totally understand his talks because it was my generation. Actually, I'm a one generation before his generation. Uh, he said on his, uh, I, I looked at his resume and uh, I would uh, give anything to have his type of experience in life. Uh, in his resume somewhere he says that he taught from sand to CPU. Sand is the silicon. Well, I am one generation ahead of him. When I came to US, silicon was just a baby. We had a vacuum tubes. And I don't know whether he studied vacuum tube or not, but I studied vacuum tube, then I studied germanium, then I studied silicon, and uh, you know, the semiconductor was something that I never understood because I kept asking my professor, what is a semiconductor? And he said, well, it, it conducts semi. It's not totally conductor and it's not non-conductor. So I said, that's like some people are half ass. Is that <laughs> true? He said, yeah, it only conducts sometime. So I said, what is so big deal about that? Well, I spent all my life learning about half ass. <laughs> so half ass, if you are half ass, you're not that bad. <laughs> you are very valuable. The whole world is running on the half ass now. If there was no semiconductor, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be talking about it. So it's a great thing. Uh, I wasn't smart and I wasn't dumb. I was kind of half ass also. So I kind of, you know, everything matched. Uh, so you see how luck works? Um, his uh, talks about this um, slide rule. I don't know, most of you probably haven't seen the slide rule. Uh, I have a granddaughter that works for Google. And uh, she graduated from MIT, bachelor and master, and I consider her pretty smart. But when I ask her some basic questions, what uh, Kevin was showing here, that, that Grandpa, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, you know, you need to go to this school called Cal Poly. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> when I graduated, we had uh, labs with every class at Cal Poly. And uh, that was uh, pretty, pretty hard to get through that one unit course. We had to work our fanny off. Um, and when we went in the industry, then we had people coming from UCLA and USC and uh, you know, no brand name, Berkeley and those kind of schools. And uh, we used to call them as second class citizens. They really did not know what the hell they were doing and they ended up working for Cal Poly graduates. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. So students, you are at the right school and your time is also right. Um, as you know, I'm supporting uh, some of the labs uh, work here at Cal Poly because I believe in the lab. Um, we have... Uh, 
So there is no substitution in life for hands-on experience. And this is what uh, Kevin has talked about. This is all this stuff, uh, you know, working for Steve Jobs for however he survived four or five years, I have to really commend him. Um, you know, people say he was the biggest asshole, I never met him, but <laughs> all the entrepreneurs are asshole. They all cut from the same cloth. <laughs> I myself was an entrepreneur. And <laughs> so uh, it's not that bad. It's not bad that, that bad, you know, as much as we make a fun of asshole, everybody's got to have one. <laughs> so uh, life is great. Life is great. Um, so again, I want to thank you for uh, a nice talk. And I enjoyed it. You know, most of my lectures at Cal Poly, I slept through, and uh, that's how I got through. Uh, but uh, this was a good refreshing class for me. Now I learned a lot today, and uh, it will be good for the next 50 years or so. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, Cordelia and uh, the staff. I want to thank all my uh, alumni friends, uh, brothers and sisters, and uh, uh, mostly the students. Uh, you. Uh, keep uh, uh, keep studying, keep working hard. Uh, life is great. Um, uh, innovation, innovation, innovation. Uh, one more thing I want to, uh, speaking of innovation, innovation doesn't have to be uh, only technical. It should be, it could be a business also. There was this, uh, uh, the show people came from India the other day, and I was talking to them, and they said, you know, Pat, uh, we have two shows in Los Angeles, then we're gonna go to New York and Boston, and uh, but we're not getting enough people. And I said, how much are you charging? And they said, well, $100 per, per head. And we put it in the entrance. Uh, you know, entrance fee is $100. I said, uh, no, 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 just put an entrance free. And, uh, have only one exit and put in front of the exit, $100 to exit. <laughs> so you see, you can be creative. <laughs> and that is exactly what I did. When I first started my business, I was in the custom power supply manufacturing. And um, the, the companies like IBM and Hewlett Packard, those companies, uh, they used to want somebody to design a custom product for them. And uh, I said, okay, that's what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna do it from my garage. Uh, but uh, nobody wanted to pay NRE. NRE is a non-reoccurring engineering charges that goes before everything else. So before customers see the product, he has to fork out 20,000, 50,000, whatever the NRE charges are. So all these companies were charging those kind of money. So what I did, I will go to IBM, get hold of their specification, design the product, show up with the product, and a product that is a, a better than anybody else can deliver price, delivery, and quality, what uh, Kevin was talking about. And uh, then I would uh, just give them a unit and I say, okay, you try it out, and if you like it, then this is my address. Well, it worked because it was a novel. Nobody was doing that. Everybody wanted money up front. I took money at the exit. <laughs> Once I got them, they couldn't go anywhere else because it was a custom product. You see, you, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? If it's a custom product, they're stuck with you, you're stuck with them, but you are at the right end, they are at the wrong end. <laughs> so who gets the benefit? You do. Uh, anyway, I, uh, I think I took a lot longer time than I thought. Uh, thank you. I'd like to say thank you to Gampan and Manju Patel for their wonderful generosity in supporting this lecture. And thank you to Kevin Grundy for being our distinguished lecturer this year. And especially thank you to all of you for attending and participating. Thank you and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the evening. Thank you.